So I'm going to kind of start us off today uh, on our topic, and uh, I'm going to hit a little bit of the background behind uh, NRCS and uh, the Natural Resources Conservation Service, and and our uh, I'm going to talk specifically about our conservation practice standards that have to do with uh, uh, manure ponds. Here's, I've got a picture here of just a typical liquid manure storage, just to kind of frame and give everybody a reference for what we're talking about. Um, in the picture, you see a, a, a large animal housing operation. Um, the water from that operation would go to a, a, a liquid manure storage structure of some type. And you'll see that there in the foreground. This one in the, in the picture is actually lined with a flexible membrane, and that's where we would store the liquid waste from manure storage. Um, a couple different ways. A couple different ways that we you'll hear people talk about these manure storages. Um, you'll hear them called uh, waste storage ponds or manure ponds, and then some people also call them lagoons. Um, I, I'm uh, Bill Reck. I'm the National Environmental Engineer for uh, NRCS, and um, to me, a, a lagoon has a specific um, meaning. A lagoon is different from a waste storage pond in that a lagoon actually um, connotates that there is some treatment that is going on. It's a different design process for a lagoon, uh, whether it's anaerobic or aerobic, than it is for a, a storage pond. So we actually have uh, another standard. Well, let's move on. We'll talk about standards. So what let's what is a conservation practice standard? NRCS establishes standards for uh, different conservation activities. Um, these standards set the minimum acceptable levels for planning, design, installation, operating, and maintenance of these conservation activities. Um, we have a set of uh, around 160 of these conservation practices. Uh, we have them all listed on our national website. Uh, there's a link here that you can, uh, if you download the materials, you can click on that link and, and get straight to uh, the listing of our national conservation practices. Um, each of those conservation practices can be tweaked by the state, each state. Um, and those tweaks have to do with um, adjusting the standard to meet local rules and regulations or perhaps meet some local uh, resource concerns or, or climate challenges within that state. So each national practice gets um, specific, you know, gets some changes made to it for each specific state. To find the state conservation practice standards, uh, you'll have to go to the NRCS website. Um, on that website, you can navigate to uh, state-specific versions of the website. And uh, on each state-specific version, you'll find uh, a link to something called the Electronic Field Office Technical Guide, EFOTG. Uh, and, and that link is how you would get to and, and find the conservation practice standards uh, for the particular state that you're interested in. Some example standards that have to do with our, our topic today, uh, waste storage structure, um, which is concerns the design of a, a manure pond or, or waste storage pond. Um, pond sealing and lining, which is a 521. There's actually several versions of that. has to do with the design of the liner for that pond. Uh, waste separation facility would be for um, taking that liquid manure stream and separating the solids and the liquids. Uh, if you wanted to store the liquid separate from the solids or take the solids for composting, uh, you, you know, that is the standard for, for that particular practice. And then nutrient management is for the ultimate use of um, the manure in terms of uh, as a uh, fertilizer uh, crop resource. Um, so that's, and that's nutrient management. Talk a little bit about waste storage structure. Um, our practice standards, as I said earlier, they're about what are the design criteria for that manure storage structure. 
And for manure storage structure, a lot of that is built upon uh, the rules and regulations um, for the Clean Water Act in, the, in terms of the sizing. Uh, we, also, we also have uh, safety considerations that are in there. We have some um, sizing constraints. There's also uh, criteria in there that are specific to the, the materials that we use in the construction of the storage structure. It contains specifications for liner systems, like whether it's compacted clay or concrete or flexible membrane. And in, in this case, for this particular standard, we actually direct you to another standard, that pond liner standard that I was just talking about. Um, one of the main criteria for waste storage structure is, is, is the capacity of the waste storage structure itself. Um, that's a key component. You know, we have to be able to store that waste for you know, the appropriate amount of time so that we can properly use that, that stored waste material. Sometimes um, NRCS will work with a producer who's already got an existing structure. Uh, when we do that, we'll have to go through a process where we evaluate that existing structure to see if it, if it meets standard or meets um, a state rule criteria uh, that's, that's required in that state. So sometimes we do have to do some evaluation uh, of existing structures. Uh, another standard that we're going to talk, talk more about today, we're going to go into uh, some detail in terms of uh, design of uh, liner. We have a 521 standard, which is our pond ceiling or lining standard. Right now we have four versions of that particular standard. We have one that's a flexible membrane. Uh, that's your, your geosynthetic material that would, uh, would line uh, your, your pond, something like a, a high-density polyethylene material. Um, another one is a dispersant treatment, and this would be a treatment where you're, you're taking a native soil that's uh, high enough in clay, that's a certain kind of clay, that you're adding a dispersant to it, a polyphosphate or soda ash that, uh, that, that changes that clay chemically slightly so that it uh, will form uh, a more, uh, a better barrier for reduction of uh, seepage through you know, the, through the ground for a, like a clay liner. Uh, and, and then Steve Reinsch is going to talk more about these last three in, in his presentation, dispersant treatment. Uh, bentonite treatment is, uh, bentonite is a, a type of clay that when you add water to it, expands a lot. Uh, and so it expands and fills crevices and, and basically will form uh, a barrier uh, to, to flow. Compacted clay treatment, uh, another um, liner, which is the process of taking uh, clay on site, either uh, native clay that is, that is in the ground where you're putting the, the, um, the waste storage pond, or clay that you're, you're getting from a borrow pit somewhere else nearby and, and bringing to the site where you're going to put in your, your waste storage pond and compact it and create a liner. So we, we have standards for each one of those for, for what you have to meet in terms of, of what that liner has to accomplish in order for us to call it um, uh, a liner. Now I put an asterisk down here for one other one, uh, concrete. Right now, NRCS doesn't have a standard for a concrete liner, although we do use concrete liners uh, in a lot of our waste storage ponds, we're, we're going to, we, we have typically done that uh, with criteria in the waste storage structure. We are in the process of creating a new standard uh, for a concrete liner because a, a concrete for a, a liner is a little different than the concrete that you use for the structural types of uh, pieces of a waste storage pond. And so we, we're going to separate that out just to make things a little bit more clear in the future. <laughs> Excuse me. So why, why have a liner in, in the first place? And why, have, um, why do we have liners with uh, waste storage? 
Well, the primary reason, obviously, is we, we want to protect groundwater resources. Uh, liners keep the, um, the stored waste from moving vertically uh, down into the ground um, towards our groundwater. Uh, what we want is we want a liner that will um, keep solids, manure organics, and things like pathogens uh, from being able to seep down. Um, and, and also, we want a liner that can limit the movement of uh, a soluble material or you know, a pollutant like ammonium, which is a, an ion of, of nitrogen, from moving uh, down into groundwater. Um, so that, you know, that's why we, we have liners. Uh, we have liner standards that, that say basically what, what is the acceptable level of protection that we want uh, this liner to achieve. You know, I want to address something um, real quick about liners and, and waste in a waste storage pond and, and seepage through um, a waste storage pond. Um, waste, waste storage ponds it will have um, sub-movement of uh, manure seepage through the liner pretty much the, regardless of, of what type of liner you have. Um, liners slow the movement of waste downward. They don't, they don't stop it. Even in the case of um, a flexible membrane, which is a you know high density polyethylene, th those things can still have places where there's you'll get tears uh, in the fabric or places where the joints aren't perfect, and you can still have some seepage through those liners. Um, depending on the type of liner, will depend on you know how much how much seepage can occur. Um, a lot of people point at uh, waste storage ponds and say there's nitrate in those waste storage ponds and that nitrate is seeping into the groundwater and causing uh, high groundwater nitrates. In, in reality, that's not exactly what's happening. What, what's happening is uh, in, our, in our manure storage ponds, we will have um, high levels of ammonia uh, in those ponds. The ammonium Ammonium ion in H4, it, it's uh, will will be there because of the the the, um, the chemistry of the waste storage pond. Um, there's not going to be hardly any nitrate in that waste storage pond. If you sampled it, you might find some close to the surface of the waste storage pond where you can have interaction with with air and you could you could have some nitrate. But for the most part, um, you're going to have ammonium in that pond. So when you have seepage through your liner, uh, that ammonium is soluble, and so it will move with the water um, through your liner. But we know that also that, that waste storage ponds can be a source of, of nitrate. And so how that happens is the ammonium that moves through can have a couple things happen to it. Uh, one of the things that can happen to it is because it's a positively charged ion, it can get absorbed to clay minerals below your waste storage pond. Um, so that can hold some of, of that ion that moves through. Some of that ammonium ion can go through a process called nitrification, uh, whereby the ammonium gets changed uh, by microbes in the soil. Uh, the microbes take... Um, oxygen in the air, they, they eat some of the organics that are there, and then they use that ammonium ion and, and they'll create nitrate. And that's in an aerobic area underneath the pod. So you can get some of that ammonium converted to nitrate. Um, that nitrate, a couple things could happen to it. Um, either one, uh, you can have some other types of microbes that uh, will act on that nitrate and convert it to a nitrogen gas through a process called denitrification. And um, that happens when you have a lack of oxygen, but you have microbes and you have something for the microbes to eat 
they'll use that nitrate, the oxygen part of that, as an oxidizing agent, and that's how they create the nitrogen gas. The other thing that can happen is if there's, there's not the right conditions for that nitrate to be converted to nitrogen gas, you can have some nitrate leaching. So the amount of nitrate leaching from a waste storage pond can depend on a lot of factors. Uh, it can depend on, you know, geology, you know, how fast that waste moves down, how much clay is below there, how deep is a water table below a waste storage pond. So there's a lot of factors that, that work into, um, you know, how much can you actually have moving from a waste storage pond into groundwater. In our CS, we have a clay liner design uh, for seepage. Our design is based on the Ag Waste Management Field Handbook, Appendix 10D. Uh, it's, it's a handbook that we have that we've developed for, our, for ourselves. And currently, our design is based on an initial seepage rate of 5,000 gallons per acre per day. We say initial seepage rate because when you first build a pond, uh, that's, and you, you put waste into it for the first time, that's what you're going to, you know, that's what we'll design for is for that initial rate to be 5,000 gallons per day. Over time, we know that some manure sealing will occur and it will reduce that rate. Um, we use that rate in terms of gallons per acre per day. We, we used to use a seepage based on a hot, hydraulic conductivity rate of one times 10 to the minus seven centimeters per second. We moved away from that as a standard because uh, that amount varies based on a lot of different things. Uh, it, can be, it can vary based on the, the depth of waste uh, in your waste storage pond. Um, so it, it's, it, we decided to go with, a, with the 5,000 number as a, as a better number for us to use for for design purposes. And Steve's going to cover this a, a little bit more detail when he gets into his presentation. Um, something else I wanted to point out is, is uh, you know, that 5,000 gallons per day when we design, that's basically the amount that would seep when the liner was, when the waste storage pond was full. So if you had a, you know, if you had a 20 foot deep waste storage pond, you know, we would we would expect that 20 gallons per day per day per acre to be the number that would occur when the pond was first built and then if it, it was full. That's not going to occur all the time um, because we empty out storage ponds. You know, some ponds will get empty two or three times a year, so you'll have uh, much less seepage uh, for part of the year when the level is much lower. Uh, and then it will get higher as the depth gets fuller. So just a little bit to explain that. So that's, that's a little bit about um, our, uh, our liner design. Um, one other thing I wanted to mention was, you know, we have a lot of structures where we are asked to go out and uh, help a producer to... Um, to, to look at, or maybe a producer wants to expand an existing structure, um, and we'll go out and we'll look at their existing structure. <clears throat> if that existing structure was was built um, with the assistance of NRCS, we will know uh, what the capability of that of that structure is. Um, sometimes there'll be structures that we don't have the records anymore uh, for what what kind of shape, what the liner, how the liner was designed. And so we won't know whether or not that liner will meet standard or not without doing some sort of, of, of measurement or some sort of evaluation process. Um, some of the ways that we can evaluate existing structure, uh, we can take uh, and do core samples in the liner. And, and in fact, you know, that, that top picture there is somebody who is... Um, they, they're digging down through a sludge layer to get to the, the bottom uh, clay liner so that they can take a core sample of that existing liner. That's, that's not a, you, you don't want to be the technician that's tasked with doing that particular chore. 
Um, other ways that we can we can look and evaluate, we can use monitoring wells. We can uh, have a groundwater well that's upgradient from the waste storage pond and one that's downgradient from the waste storage pond. Uh, look at the difference in the water quality between those two points and, and say something about um, how much um, pollution is occurring, how much nitrate is getting into uh, that groundwater. What it can't tell us is it can't tell us a rate. You know, how, are we meeting that 5,000 gallons per day or not? A, a monitoring well won't tell you that, but it will tell you uh, whether or not you've got some significant uh, leakage that's occurring. Um, the other method that's, uh, that's, that we use is a what method called water balance, and that's where we're actually physically going out and, and over time, over, over time, measuring a seepage rate. Uh, and that's, uh, there's going to be a presentation in February that's going to go over that process in a lot more detail. Um, there's a, uh, a new uh, measurement technique or a new sensor that's been developed. Uh, there's going to be somebody who's going to talk about that in, in February and go through that in a lot more detail. So those are some of the ways uh, that we, you know, evaluate an existing structure. Uh, in terms of the liner as to whether or not it meets standard. We would also have to do some, some measuring of the size of the structure and making sure that it had an adequate capacity for the waste that was being generated or that was projected to be generated, you know, in the, in the near future. So there I've kind of covered um, um, some about some, some basics about conservation practice standards and, and NRCS and, and our standard for waste storage ponds and, and liners.